I'm Tony Ruiz of Gold Derby here with Matt Ogans, who has directed uh, Audible, which is a new documentary short uh, that has been shortlisted uh, at the upcoming Oscars. And and Matt, you know, I'm a, I'm a big I'm totally fascinated by by titles. Um, at what point during this documentary did you come up with the title of Audible? Because it has so many layers oh, to it. A few years, several years before we made the film. <laughs> I mean, it took, it took it took over ten years to to get it made, so a lot of time to think about it. Well, what was the, what was the genesis of this film? Um, a few things brought me to it. Uh, so I I'm from the area. I grew up about thirty minutes away. My family's still there, uh, so I knew of the school. More importantly, uh, my best friend since I was seven or eight years old, still my best friend. Uh, is death. Uh, and then when I started directing, I directed uh, a branded content project about high school football teams around the country. And one of them was Maryland School for the Deaf. So it brought me back to a school near where I grew up, subject matter that was close to me and I didn't feel like it was a coincidence. So I formed a bond with the school and stayed in touch and felt like there was a bigger story to tell and had lots of stops and starts and different partners along the way and almost sales and, you know, and um, I'm glad it took this long because I, I love this version of it. And um, yeah, I'm really happy with how it ended up. The, the, the film, for those who have not seen it, is basically follows this football team that at the School for the Deaf in Maryland that is is such a on the surface is just like every other football team. Um, it's really about the, you know, there's there's certainly how the, the I thought one of the great parts of the film was how the other schools view this football team. Mm -hmm. And um, if you had to boil it down to kind of like this this kind of through line of the film, what is, what do you think is the through line of the film? What is the what is the the central anchor that you're tied to on this film? I don't. I don't look at this as a sports film. I look at this as a coming of age film. You know, it's about teenagers on the cusp of a really big moment in their life. You know, going from high school out in, even though they're going to college, kind of out into the real world. Now compound that if you're deaf, you know, metaphorically you're going from, you know, the safety of a deaf high school into a hearing world. And uh, football does, gives it a structure. And, you know, and a narrative arc, a structure and a narrative arc. Um, and I also think that sports is such a great metaphor for life and the ups and downs. And even each game tells a story. You know, I'm just saying I wouldn't lead with it's almost like it's sports and football is one facet of his life. Right. Um, and it's yeah, it's the hook of the film. Um, and they're really good. I, you know, I don't look at them and they don't look at themselves. They're not a deaf football team. They're a football team that happens to be deaf. And it's, re it's really interesting how that is juxtaposed with this kind of idea that there, there, there is a, also a sense of they have this community, but yet individually there are certain moments of, of feeling really isolated, it seemed like. Sure. I mean, you're still dealing with whatever you're dealing with, right? Look at Teddy, and I don't, you know, without giving it away, look at Teddy. Um, you're still dealing with stuff that every teenager deals with. Um, so give me the question again. Well, I mean, I, I, there is this, there is this sort of every man quality to okay. these kids. Yeah. But still in isolation. But so still, there's a sense right. of isolation. Right. So, so they're still dealing with their stuff and maybe it's something that like Teddy perhaps didn't want to talk to someone else or, you know, they still got to go home after school, right? Or, or on weekends. And so you, you might be in your bedroom alone. Um, you might be in a house like Amari that he's the only deaf person, you know? Um, even if they know some sign language, you know, a lot of this is about communication, right? Access, communication um, to help them thrive. So, yeah, there's like a, a safety or a utopia on campus in some ways. Uh, and 
I don't want to say it's dangerous out there. It's just there's more to contend with. But I like to think that the schools prepared them for this. The, you know, the coach, Coach Ryan prepared them. Mr. Tucker, the superintendent, the teachers, I, I hope. You know, I, what I witness is they're, they try to prepare them. You know, I, when I see the coaches talking to the kids, they're not just talking about football. Yeah, that's one of the things that I think really kind of struck me is that, you know, you take the, the deaf element out and these kids have so many of the struggles that so many young people have. Yeah. Um, at, at what point did you know that Amari was going to be the center of this film? Oh, a year before I made it. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, like, I remember, I knew I wanted a senior, right? Because graduating. So that means every year I had to recast because they graduated. You know, I could look at a junior for a year forward. And so every couple of years, I I'd kind of recast. And uh, I guess it was it was Amari's junior year. I went, did a bunch of interviews with the team, spent a couple of days there, and I didn't know about Teddy. I didn't, I didn't have, I didn't probe for that. He he wanted to share that, and then uh, other people on the team then did too. But so did Jalen, and then I saw that connection between them, and that I, you know, I knew I knew right away. Um, yeah. So how does, as a filmmaker, how do you go about establishing that sense of trust with these, with these kids and their families? Because, you know, it, to be exposed like this, you know, is, is difficult, I think for any kid. So how did they, how did you build that relationship with them? I, I like 10 different ways. So one, in this case, 10 years, first getting the trust of the school, right? Um, so that relationship, so, you know, kids and their parents are going to look, make sure the school are comfortable, you know, they're going to look to the school too. So forming that relationship with, with the coaches and Mr. Tucker, the superintendent of the school at the time and going back and showing up, you know, so I was invited in is part of it. Having a friend that's deaf and being naturally curious and really caring um, a lot of this just has to do with documentary filmmaking or any filmmaking, which is, you know, connecting with every character or participant in the film, right? Every subject. And that, that also means me sharing of myself. You know, there's things that maybe I dealt with that I'll, uh, I'll share to them and start creating the bond, spending time with them. You know, the process doesn't start when the camera's rolling. It, it starts... The first time you talk to them, text them, direct message them, any kind of communication is R and D, you know, um, and not in a manipulative way. You're trying to organically connect, you know, because you want to care about the film you're making. It's not just a job, you know. I don't know. I'm rambling. No, no, no. It, it what I find so you know, moving about about this film in particular is the fact that there are so many different aspects of this film that could have been their own film. Like, you know, the, the Teddy story could have been its own film. The, mm -hmm. the, the, the Jalen story could have been its own film. The relationships. Amari and, Amari and Lira's, yeah. uh, the, the romantic uh, version of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so were you ever tempted to focus on one thing over the other, or was it really important to you to take this kind of like global view of it? You know, I've kind of evolved and now I try to plan a little bit and go into each scene with intent. Although there are a lot of verite scenes too that, you know, and a game, but also verite scenes, whatever happens, happens. Um, but also leave room for some magic to happen. But I did kind of go in, yeah, I knew that these folks were gonna be in it before I started filming, I did. In fact, I would, I would say it was a struggle because that's a lot of people for a 38 minute film, right? Mm -hmm. And I wanted to go deep. And so 
it's really not an ensemble. It's really Amari is the main character in that all the other characters are through his point of view, right? The relationship with Lyra, how you meet Jalen, Teddy, the father, it's all through his point of view. It's his relationships. So it's all connected. And I want, you know, part of growing up or, or, or life is relationships. So it was important to me to show those different facets because it was a coming of age story. So what are the elements? You know, it's relationships and family and um, mental health, communication, right? Um, I wanted to cover those things that teenagers, that I, you know what, we all deal with. No, we do. And, and what, I, what I'm curious about is, has this film, has the, has the making of this film influenced the kind of films you want to make in the future? Or do you kind of just take each project individually? Um, no, I think, I don't know how conscious, but sure. I mean, I'm always, I don't want to be complacent. So I'm always trying to challenge myself, especially visually, right? Something that scares me. How do I do this different? I like to not... I like to think of myself as an unconventional filmmaker in terms of docs in that I try to do it a little differently, not in a gimmicky way. I try to make it organic to that thing, but in my brain, I visually, I think narratively. And then the authenticity comes from what happens, you know, within the, the frame. Right. Um, but, you know, you spend time, with a community or people, and that changes you just in general in life, right? And so certainly that's gonna make me think differently and feel differently and, and maybe what's important to me may change, you know? But I don't know for me if it's that conscious, you know? I mean, it's interesting. I mean, I'm thinking about the project that I'm on now. Um, you can see a progression of why I might be doing this one. Ooh. But I also like to like mix it up and like, hey, let's just try something like totally different. Well, is there something about documentary filmmaking? Is, is there a freedom in documentary filmmaking that you don't get necessarily from typical fiction? There's freedom and then there's not freedom because you mm. don't know the ending. You don't know what someone's going to say. I mean, I, it's really, you know, documentaries are hard. Really not. I mean, they're all hard. Filmmaking is hard, but it's like, it's hard. It's a lot of hours. You don't know what's going to happen. They're not actors that are going to show up on time. You don't have a big crew. You know what I mean? It's even if you have a good budget, it's, um, it's hard, but it's also magical and amazing. And um, yes, there's some, in some ways, a freedom in, you know what there's a freedom in? But you have to decide this yourself, each individual filmmaker. Uh, I'm not always good at it. <laughs> Giving up control, right? So you, that means, and, you know, look, it's all, it's all psychology. It's all therapy, right? And so you have to, or I have to surrender, let go, give up control, whatever you want to call it, at least of the things that I can't control, right? And you do the best you can within those parameters. And sometimes if you don't get to, sometimes I've been really rigid. I pictured a way to shoot something or what someone's going to say, and it didn't happen that way. And I, it, you know, I get frustrated. And I don't know what to do. And then what I've learned to do is like, hey, I don't want to say everything happens for a reason. That sounds um, cliche, but more if you're present and mindful, and especially if it's something you're not in control and don't freak out, the thing that ends up happening might be as good or better, or because you're not so rigid and attached to one thing you, you pictured, you might come up with a creative solution that's even better. And so there's a freedom in that. 
but you have to be willing to surrender and let go. In, in surrendering and letting go, are you then able to enjoy when the film gets the response that it's gotten, you know, being shortlisted for the Oscars? I mean, that's not something that happens to everybody. How, how have you uh, been feeling about that? Yeah, I mean, it, it, not to get too personal, but, you know, I, I get uncomfortable with things sometimes and blush. And I like to think that it's about the film and especially about the people in the film. And so to it, an Oscar shortlist, it and hopefully beyond brings attention to not only Amari and Jalen and Lyra, you know, and the school and the football team, but the deaf community. And so if that helps bring attention to it and representation, um, and in a, in a celebratory way, right? Uh, it's amazing. You know, it's amazing. So yeah, the whole, of course it's great. Um, and, and also all the people that worked really hard on this film, you know, everyone, it's, it's great. I'm humbled by it and grateful. It is, it is, a, it is just a magnificent and I think really joyous and uplifting film in a time that uh, we need it. Uh, more Thanks. than ever. Um, everybody go to goldderby.com, make your predictions for the Oscars, and stay tuned for interviews with more contenders throughout the season. Uh, Matt Ogans, uh, Audible is the film. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Tony, thanks for having me.